So I have a confession. When I was growing up, I loved maps. I soon figured out that I could go to a local library and buy old copies of National Geographic for like a dime and get a great map with each one. I have to admit, I took the maps out. And sometimes I'd read the magazine, sometimes not, but the, the maps were the, the, the prized possession. Today, maps are pretty much a thing of the past. We have GPS and can obtain directions to wherever we are, walking, running, or driving in just a few seconds. I made it a point to teach my own children north, south, east, and west, but many of their friends are pretty clueless. But maps are still very important. As we record this episode on Juneteenth of 2023, there is a war raging in Europe, much over the map of Russia and Ukraine. And to understand our past, we also must turn to maps, which leads us to today's discussion about the book, Mapping America, the incredible story and stunning hand-colored maps and engravings that created the United States by steam authors Neil Asbury and Jean-Pierre Ispatz. Fellow Patriots, I am Judge Michael Warren of the Oakland County, Michigan Circuit Court, a former member of the State Board of Education, co-founder of Patriot Week with my daughter Leah, and your host for this episode of Patriot Lessons. I'm also the author of America's Survival Guide and the host of Patriot Lessons American History and Civics Podcast. Today, we are joined by author Jean-Pierre Ispatz. Jean-Pierre is a historian, best-selling National Geographic author, and award-winning screenwriter and film director. A humanities scholar, his research has been devoted to biblical archaeology, Renaissance Florence, the 19th century Europe, and so much more. He also serves as a doctoral professor in the social sciences PhD program of the Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California. His website is www.jpisbouts.com. B-O-U-T-S dot org. In his spare time, or what's left of it, he likes to discover new places in Asia and the Middle East with his wife, Kathy, a production executive. The father of four children and grandfather of four beautiful boys with the fifth on the way. Maybe he's already arrived. I'm not sure. He and Kathy live in Santa Monica with Katie, a highly opinionated Labrador retriever. Jean-Pierre, welcome. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Now, you are a true polymath. Focusing on your considerable talents on a variety of projects, you founded Art Space Studio in Los Angeles, produced a number of recordings for of Bach and Handel and Tchaikovsky, among many others. You've made films featuring programs with Leonard Nimoy, one of my absolute favorites, uh, Charlton Heston, another one of my favorites, and The Son of Michigan, Dick Van Dyke. You're the editor-in-chief of two multimedia encyclopedias written on biblical history and so much more. And you got a new book coming out, too. You've authored 10 books, I guess now maybe a dozen, and sold 2 million copies, which makes me compelled to ask you, why did you write this book? Well, it's a, that's a good, <laughs> good question. Um, it, it so happened that uh, my, uh, uh, our agent, my agent, uh, uh, Peter Miller, introduced me to a very uh, unique individual uh, in America. His name is Neil Asbury. And Neil Asbury, he has his own radio show. He is an entrepreneur. He's the quintessential American entrepreneur. He has many companies that he has consolidated. But one passion that he developed uh, in his lifetime is that of collecting maps. Uh, he really is enamored with, with maps. And, you know, it's interesting because as a historian, I must confess that throughout my entire program at university, first in Leiden and then at Columbia University in New York. We never really looked at maps. You know, it, as historians, we, uh, we we looked at engravings, but we're really more text driven. We are really uh, driven by what the documentation uh, we can find about a particular period in time. And we never really looked at maps. And Neil said, you know, it's interesting because when we talk about the American Revolution, when we talk about the growth of America over the centuries, we always, we may have a painting here and there, uh, but but you, you historians, you, you never look at the maps. And yet it is the maps of the time that show the organic growth of the initial colonies on the Eastern seaboard. Of course, the French occupation of North America and what would become Canada and Quebec. Uh, and, and slowly, the, these maps then give you a almost a time-lapse impression 
of how our country grew over time. And you can see that beautifully illustrated in the maps starting from the Waldsee Müller map, for example, from 1507. This is the very, very first map in history that actually shows the American continent. It was just a sliver then. <laughs> no, nobody really knew what it would look like. But this is just a few years after Christopher Columbus and Waldsee Müller. Uh, uh, showed that sliver of the new world in his world map, the very first time that happened. And he called it America after Amerigo Vespucci, the, the famous explorer who followed in the wake of Christopher Columbus to the new world. And, and so when Neil and I got together and we talked about that, he said, gee, you know, you're absolutely right. We should write a book. We should write a book about the way that America grew over time as illustrated by the maps of the period. Nobody's ever done that. I mean, there are books about maps. There are even books about American maps. But nobody's really told the story of how our nation came together uh, and used the maps of the era to illustrate that. And so uh, we did it. We decided to do that. We had a wonderful publisher, Apollo Publishers, who really seized on the idea. They thought it was a terrific idea. And uh, they decided to publish it as a, for a full color illustrated book, a hardcover. And uh, we're so incredibly uh, grateful to them that they were able to realize our dream and, and get the book published. Well, I have to say it's a absolutely gorgeous book and I, I'm going to try my best to show it on, on the screen here. Um, and hopefully uh, we can have some uh, other inserts later, but um, it, it really is remarkable. It is, is, like I said, it's gorgeous. And I think that your, your time was well spent. Your publisher treated you very well. And I appreciate that. So the very beginning of your, of the book begins with Sir Walter Riley. And, and why did you decide to start there as the, as the introduction to the mapping of America? Well, Sir Walter Riley is a very important figure. You know, we, he appears in that wonderful motion picture, Elizabeth, that was produced, what, 15, 20 years ago. But Sir Walter Riley was one of the first explorers of the Eastern seaboard. And, uh, and of course, he's the founder of one of the first colonies on the Eastern seaboard. And uh, regrettably, he fell afoul of uh, the successor of Elizabeth. Um, he did some things that were not completely kosher. He attacked a Spanish galleon, you know, because Spain and England at the time were at each other's loggerheads. They were in fierce economic competition, particularly for the gold and silver that the Spanish ships were extracting from particularly Central and South America. And so Sir Walter Riley uh, was able to hold, hold his own, if, if you will. And we make the point that if it hadn't been for Walter Riley, we may all be speaking Spanish right now in this country rather than English. But it is Sir Walter Riley who um, you know, introduced English law, uh, the English civilization, uh, the principle of an, of an English community based on tolerance, religious tolerance, uh, and so many things that uh, we now, of course, pride as being the quintessential virtues of the American experiment, the idea of freedom, uh, the idea of, of, a, of a government and a community, a commonwealth ruled by law, by English law. There's still many aspects of the English law in, in today's constitution. So, so you, we felt that we really had to start with this quint quintessential figure because not many Americans realize that that's how our great story of the, of, uh, of America started. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, th I think you chose a, an exemplary place. And, and now, of course, we had this debate in our country about 1776 versus 1619. You picked another place to start. And um, I, who am I to argue with that? I think that was great. Um, so you probably don't know this, but I've also written a book called America's Survival Guide. Now I have a long subtitle. How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our First Principles in History. That's long. 
But yours is even longer. It's the incredible story and stunning hand-colored maps and engravings that created the United States. And I'm really intrigued by that last phrase that created the United States. What do you mean by that? I think that a lot of who we are, particularly if we go back to the 18th century, um, is the fact that there was a sense of a manifest destiny very early on in the American experiment. I mean, the 13 colonies were obviously uh, largely independent. I mean, the north of the colonies, of course, was in New England, was prim very much religious in, in character. The south, the southern colonies were very much focused on a uh, a society that was still very Anglican in character, a certain aristocracy, landowners who had tremendously big plantations. And then we had the central states, Pennsylvania, New York, and these were largely populated by people who had come from Europe, who were the middle class, we would call it, craftsmen. They didn't have a particular strong feeling about religion. Many of them were Catholics uh, or, or Lutherans. Uh, but their focus was not so much on, on religion, but on, on building a society that would, would reward them for hard work and would allow them to raise their children, their families in, in freedom without fear for persecution for any reason whatsoever or war. You know, we have to, uh, we have to remember that 18th century Europe was a messy place. <laughs> it was, there was a reason why so many people fled uh, Europe in that time. Uh, the 30-year war, which was largely fought between the Catholic and Protestant nations at the time, had devastated the European continent. Uh, there was famine, uh, entire villages, towns had been destroyed, uh, and yet still the great powers of the time, Britain, France, Holland, were at each other's throats, largely for economic reasons, uh, Spain, of course, as well. And so you see this, this idea emerging in the colonies of creating a new form, a new society, a society where you didn't have to worry about war, about turmoil. You could develop your, your land, you can cultivate your land, you can work hard and together create a commonwealth that would stand out as a beacon uh, in the world, even though, of course, they still consider themselves, for a large part, uh, a member of the British crown, um, that idea of a unique American individualism uh, emerged very early on, uh, as we show in, in the book. And so when you see that after the, the Indian Wars, in which Britain sent an expeditionary force to protect the colonists from uh, the various wars that were being fought with Indian nations, even though several Indian nations fought on the side of the colonists, you see that suddenly there is a change of heart in, uh, in, in Great Britain. You see that um, King George III now feels that, you know, these colonists of ours, they, they have to pay up. I mean, they have to pay for the protection that we've been extending them for all these years which was a radical uh, change of heart from the preceding period in which you know, benign neglect was really <laughs> the, the rule of thumb in London. And they had lots of other things on their plate, but the British treasury was empty. It was completely empty. And one of the ways in which the, from all these wars that they were fighting and one of the ways in which they felt that the treasury could be replenished is by taxing now the American colonists. And of course, that's when that, that robust American individualism rose to the surface and saying, wait a minute, we're, 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 we are our own commonwealth. We are our own community and uh, we will not be taxed without representation. And so you see the slide to war uh, and ultimately the American Revolutionary War. And we, we actually follow that war through fascinating maps that were created here again, you know, at, at, as historians, we, we, we have neglected that, that, that you can actually get a snapshot of some of those great uh, battles that were fought in the American Revolutionary War. 
through these great maps, many of them created by uh, cartographers on the British side, and then were shipped with a fast schooner back to London, quickly engraved, presented to the king and his war council, and based on those maps, the king would then make his decision about what next strategy to pursue. So maps played a, a pivotal role, not only in the development of uncertain American identity, but also in the conduct of the war. And, uh, and that's why it's, uh, it's so fascinating to see this, this story unfold of how we became a nation uh, through the prism of these maps. Very well said. And I, I want to point out that your the book does have maps of uh, Boston, for example, and, and Bunker Hill and, and the important uh, theater there, as well as uh, New York and uh, the Eastern Seaboard. And you, you kind of forget um, how stretched out the, the uh, Revolutionary War was. And in fact, um, as you, your book poignantly points out on page 224, you write, quote, the problem was North America was not a country. It was a vast continent where the distance between Britain's forces in Quebec and those in the Carolinas were all over 1,300 miles. To think that any nation, British or otherwise, could subdue such a vast territory with just 30,000 men was pure delusion. And yet no British general ever truly grasped that simple fact. So you just went through that process telling us about how, in essence, their war strategy was built upon the maps that they, you know, they had come over uh, the Atlantic and engraved and given to uh, the king and his advisors. Why couldn't they look at the map and go, wait a minute, we can't win this with 30,000 soldiers or 100,000 probably? Well, that's, that's a great question. And uh, I always take some delight in answering that question because you have to remember that these people were used to seeing maps of, of England, right? They were used to seeing maps of very a scale, small, right? Of a yeah. scale that showed that well, you well, you know, you could march from London to Manchester in a in a week or so, and so so the, the, psychologically, they they transferred the uh, the reading the readability of their own maps of of Great Britain, transposed them on the maps of 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 America, and completely underestimated. The Vast distances. I mean, in those days, there were no trains, there were no planes, there were no cars. All the the foraging and the food and the ammunition and all the the, the trains of of material that you need to conduct uh, a long term war had to had to cover vast distances, and they completely they completely uh, underestimated that. And of course, that's why George Washington pursued a guerrilla warfare, basically attacking that long train and doing so very, very successfully until the final showdown in Yorktown, um, where with the help of the, uh, of the French Navy, uh, he was able to close up the uh, encircle the British forces and defeat them. So uh, it, it's a wonderful thing that, that, you know, we're all human, you know, we're all humans and we sort of are used to seeing maps you know, anyone who's ever, I, 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 I got to tell you this, this is so funny that uh, I, I get a lot of, because I travel a lot and I, I write books about European history, I, I often get people who ask me, you know, I'm going to Italy or I'm going to France. I'm going to uh, visit Rome, then I'm going to take the train to uh, Florence, then I'm going to take the train to Venice, and then I want to see a little bit of Naples. And I always tell them, people, you, you completely underestimate the distances involved. I mean, if you want to see Italy, <clears throat> go to Rome and stay a week there or go to Florence and spend a week or 10 days there. Don't try to see it all at once. You'll spend half the time traveling and not having a great time because traveling these days post pandemic is not a whole lot of fun. And the same thing you can say about the British forces in the on the American continent. They spent most of their time getting from A to B and waiting for their, their train to catch up with them. Uh, and, and so they really were never in a position to subdue the, uh, the colonists. And of course, uh, that's why we have our great nation today. Uh, that makes it so funny because I just came back from Italy and 
And we spent a week in Rome and then we went a little bit in Venice and then we did Sicily. And my wife said, we're just getting an appetizer of Sicily. We need to come back. Like you're absolutely right. So great, great travel advice. I didn't know that you were going to give us travel advice, but thank you for that. Um, so uh, I want to ask you about this particular photo because, or excuse me, uh, it's not a photo. It's a wonderful painting, which is uh, the death of uh, General um, Warren, uh, drafted by or painted by uh, John Trumbull. And I, I have to ask because uh, consistent viewers of the show will know that I'm the great, 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 et cetera, um, nephew of, of him. And I was wondering why you selected that of all the great paintings that there are. And you have many others in the book. But why did what was compelling about that one to to make sure it got a, a special uh, notation in the book? Well, I, I, I'm an art historian, I have to confess, uh, even though I, I've done a lot of other work in purely history, but I'm an art historian. And I'm a great fan of 18th century art, 18th century Baroque art. So I was really st struck by the drama and, uh, and pathos of, of that work. Trumbull, of course, was a great artist. Many of these artists were educated or trained uh, in Britain and, and then came to the United States. In fact, much of, of what we know as 18th and 19th century painting in, uh, in America was, was influenced by the British Academy until the middle of the 19th century when suddenly French, the French Academy and the French style of uh, painting, which we call Beaux-Arts, took over. And I must confess that what struck me about the painting was its sheer beauty and its sheer drama. And the way they capture, the way the artists of that time capture the battlefield, you know, it, uh, the, 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 the terrible destruction of war, you know, when you have muskets and when you have cannon, uh, as we would see uh, during the Civil War uh, in the next century, can, can create tremendous, tremendous bloodshed. Uh, it was a messy business, the American uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, there was no quarter given. Uh, and, um, you know, many times people fought hand to hand. And yet these artists were able to, to raise the battles of the time, the experience of warfare, to a, a very noble level. Uh, where glory, I mean, uh, a concept that of to today we, of course, don't refer to anymore. But in the 18th century, the glory of the battlefield was very much uh, a real concept. I mean, you went to war and to die on the battlefield was perhaps one of the, the greatest uh, achievements that a, an officer could achieve. And this painting captures that so beautifully, the, 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 the drama and pathos and, and the glorious uh, achievement that is captured in this painting. So that's why I really wanted to, to print this. And, and again, uh, the, the quality of the illustrations in the book are, are absolutely phenomenal. And uh, I say that because I've, uh, published a number of other illustrated books with National Geographic uh, about biblical history particularly. And so I know that uh, it's very difficult and expensive this day and age to create an illustrated uh, book. And I'm very proud to say that Mapping America was printed not in China, <laughs> in America. There was an American printer who printed the book. And in fact, the book is now going through its second print run. We are very proud of that. And uh, every every fiber of that book was made in America, which is, I guess, appropriate when you write Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. Well, that's fabulous. I'm so glad to hear that. And you, you, you told our audience that as well. So uh, we are almost out of time, but I know that you have a new book that's coming out called uh, The Fractured Kingdom, which sounds fascinating. So if you could give us a couple minute overview of that, that would be great. Well, thank you so much. The Fractured Kingdom is uh, in some ways a continuation uh, of what we did with Mapping America because Mapping America, Neil and I really felt that uh, we're so divided in America right now. We really are. Uh, the culture wars, the political ideas have divided us and we wanted to write Mapping America to, 
to impress the fact that even though we might be divided by political ideas, at the end of the day, we're all Americans. We all share that same dream. The fractured kingdom does that for the Christian community, the American Christian community. And then the fractured kingdom, which is uh, published by Morehouse. Uh, what I try to do is say, let's try to bridge the gulf between uh, progressives and conservatives in the Christian community, between left and right, uh, by returning to the essential precepts that, that Jesus taught. And I do that by using the, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. I go back to the Aramaic text, the original text, and I try to explain what each of these verses mean in the context of the time. Jesus lived in a very, very difficult time, socioeconomic crisis, lots of warfare, lots of uh, rebellions. And I hope that, as with Mapping America, that the Fractured Kingdom will help to bridge the gulf between left and right in the, uh, in the Christian community. That is an awesome sentiment and so much needed. I could not have been more eloquent about the need to unify our country and uh, your works are certainly a pathway to that. And I want to commend you and your co-author in connection with Mapping America, along with, uh, I'm really excited to, to, to read the new book too. This is, this is going to be great. So John Pierre, thank you so much for being here and best of luck in all of your endeavors. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hopefully this episode will informed you and illuminated your thinking on the mapping of America and the broader context of American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to establish new government, laying its foundation such principles and organizing its power such forms to them so seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Those words for the Declaration of Independence were revolutionary in 1776 and remain revolutionary today. And we've been blessed with the freedoms given to us by brave men and women who approved the Declaration of Independence and forged our country, uh, mapped it out, as was said by our guests today, uh, as well as our constitution. And it's our responsibility to protect those gains and those blessings. Maps have played an important role to creating this place we call America and we need to cherish it. Generations upon generations of people have worked to secure our liberties and we must continue to fight for it. And to do that, we need to understand our history and constitution and be willing to defend it. And that is what Patriot Week is all about. Join us at PatriotWeek.org and the Patriot Week YouTube channel. We also have a podcast very similarly named to this, which is the Patriot Lessons American History and Civics Podcast. And don't forget my book, America's Survival Guide. Until next time, thank you. God bless you and God bless America.